Thank you so much. Uh, as you heard, my name is Zakaria Mwindi. I work with Map Kibera as the project coordinator. And in this uh, presentation, I'll be sharing the work that we've been doing in Nairobi uh, around uh, mapping impacts of COVID-19. So we'll just start with some background uh, where we were when COVID hit uh, Kenya. Yeah, so uh, when we first had the first case of uh, COVID-19 in Kenya, that was around March, uh, Kibera was projected to be one of the areas that will be highly uh, impacted by the pandemic uh, for various reasons. Uh, one of them was the issue to do with uh, social distancing. Uh, as you can see in the photo on the right, that's an interview. Someone was just sharing the challenges that they have and what they foresee uh, in terms of social distancing, which will be a challenge in, in such a community because you'll find like on a normal day, uh, you'll uh, find like families uh, in, within a household, there are like almost seven people. So telling such people to social distance, then also the nature of the homes, how they are, people live so closely to each other. So that was going to be a, a, a challenge. And then there was also the issue of access to clean water. Uh, I think by the time uh, the pandemic, at the peak of the pandemic, we also had challenges with accessibility to water. I think at the same time, uh, most of the taps were running dry and that uh, proved to be a challenge for the community because here the government is telling you you need to sanitize, you need to make sure that uh, you're, you're washing your hands on a regular basis, then uh, you don't have water. So how are you going to do that? then you're being told you need to keep distance, that's also going to be a challenge. And I think based on those factors, it was really like it was true that Kibera might be one of the areas that may be highly hit by the, by the pandemic. The other challenge that we noticed, I don't know if you, uh, it was a problem that we, we saw globally, and it was, this was about misinformation, uh, especially at the peak of the, uh, of the, of the pandemic. There was a lot of information going around. Uh, there were a lot of rumors. People were saying uh, COVID virus can't survive in warm weather. So if you're in Kenya, you are safe. Uh, COVID doesn't affect kids, of course. And then kids can move around. Uh, and also, one of the one that was really going around was hot beverages can cure COVID. And at that point, lemons became more expensive than any other fruit in Kenya because everyone was purchasing. In fact, at one point, we had shortage of lemons because people were being told, if you take lemon and ginger, then you are safe. And then also there was a rumor about 5G network, which is causing uh, COVID, so people started avoiding using phones. Uh, they didn't want to any, uh, any, like interact with people who had like 5G phones. So there was a lot of misinformation that was going around, and we thought this could, was even more uh, proved to be a danger than even uh, what uh, we were, uh, was being projected. Because with the misinformation, then people, that meant people will ignore the directives that are coming from the government, and they will take, not take these things serious. So as an organization, we decided to launch what we call uh, Kenya COVID-19 Tracker. So basically, this was to uh, one to map reported cases of COVID <coughs> sorry, in Kibera and countrywide. So there was also a lot of misinformation that people are getting uh, the, uh, COVID and people are now trying to uh, like sideline people. So there was a lot of fear that was going around, especially if you hear someone has contacted or has, has tested positive. The, there was a lot of uh, people are just uh, sidelining each other. So we thought, why don't we just launch this uh, platform where people, we can be able to map uh, reported cases so that we can counter some of the mis misinformation that is coming from the community. Also, pro, uh, we were also doing this to map out resources. So there are a lot of organizations that came in and they were providing resources, they were providing food, uh, providing sanitary pads for girls if they need one. So, and this was being done in an un uncoordinated way. So you'll find like uh, resources are there, these things are being provided, but they don't know where to get them. So the aim of this platform was also to help them get to know where they can access these uh, resources. 
And then the other thing is also providing relevant information, like the right information coming from the Ministry of Health, like you make sure that, uh, that you're providing the community the right information. So this will help to curb the misinformation that was going around. And then also organization could post about the initiatives. So if they are doing any project or providing, <coughs> sorry, they're providing resources within the community, they can easily map them on the, on the map. Then people can be able to know where they are and how they can access this. And one of the biggest initiatives that was being carried in the, in the, in the community was placement of and, uh, and washing facilities within uh, the community so people could be able to access clean water and soap uh, in strategic areas. So that means that the reg uh, regular people could access water and can easily sanitize at any time, especially if they're coming from their jobs or uh, going out. And then uh, also maybe just, so this project, uh, we carried it in different phases. So we, the, fa the first phase, we got funding from uh, Hot Micro Grant, which helped us to continue the work that you are doing, and also doing trainings for, for students who are at home and they didn't have anything to do. So we are organizing like remote mapping uh, trainings so that they can learn new skills as they are also at home, but also engaging other community members to, to enhance their skills. At the same time, we also got funding from uh, from Mushahidi uh, through UKID, where it supported us now to extend the work from Kibera. We also moved to another location called Madare. So we are now doing both Madare and, and Kibera. And then uh, early last year, we, we, we launched this uh, project uh, on COVID, uh, cities COVID mitigation mapping. So basically what you wanted to do now is to map the uh, impacts of COVID-19. And this was a project funded by, by MapGive uh, through State Department. And ideally we focused on in two areas, that is water and sanitation and education, because we felt like these are one of the areas that were really affected. Uh, and as I mentioned earlier, we had issues of water uh, back then, so the project we carried it in a way that we were conducting surveys, getting to understand how, how the community coped with issues of water. Were they able to access water uh, all the time? Were there, were there a need to have extra water? And also at the same time, because of uh, other regulations that were being placed by the government, like curfews, that meant uh, people who run businesses, most of, them, most of the families in Kibera uh, depend on uh, on a daily basis chose uh, businesses. So most of them operate from six up to 10. Then with the introduction of curfew, that meant most of them were losing their, their income. Then here you are, you have been told you need to uh, get more water. So how are they coping with that? You've lost your job, you don't have enough money. How can you be able to provide for your family and, and like getting in, um, enough water? And then there was also an issue about was the water that they are getting? Is it clean? Is it because uh, there are a lot of projects that were being uh, set up on to provide water? But again, we are trying to find out the water that was being provided. Do they feel like it's safe for them to consume? Then, on in the area of education, we we realized that also there was a drastic. There were a lot of drastic changes in schools. So most of them ended up either closing up or. Uh, the number of students were, uh, w went down because families were moving from one area to another. So we were trying to understand how, how were parents coping with that. And especially also during that time, schools were closed for like six months. How were parents coping with staying at home? Uh, were they able to support their children? The government was insisting on e-learning. E how, 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 how are they handling that? Like staying at home with the children? and also assisting them with their education. So these are some of the outcomes from both the surveys and also the, uh, the field work uh, where we went to the schools. So you can see that a lot of, most of them are, I'll say, negative because we saw a lot of schools uh, being closed. We also realized the downsizing of schools because most of them are also depending, these schools depend on parents paying school fees. 
her parents has lost his job. She can't support uh, a, a child going back to school. Then that meant a lot of students were also dropping out of school. And because they're also depending on school fees, that meant they can't pay. Because their, their schools are also based on rental spaces. So if you are not getting enough income coming in, then you have to downsize. So schools that had like eight classes had to reduce either four. To, then that means also the, uh, there was a, a, lot of, a lot of overcrowding of students in classes. Uh, again, issues of water prices going up because when the demand is high and there's shortage, of course, people just try to tend to uh, uh, put the prices up. Uh, loss of jobs, as I mentioned, a lot of people depend on daily jobs and with the curfews and businesses being closed during that time, a lot of families, uh, a lot of people lost their jobs. And then high cost of living, of course, because here yeah, you are, you've lost your job and you have to sustain your family, yeah, it was really proven to be a challenge. Then relocation of students, so most of parents decided living in Nairobi is not easy for them and then they decided to move back to, to their rural areas. That meant also we saw a lot of number of students moving from Nairobi and going to, to the rural areas. But now there's no guarantee that they will continue their education. And we saw this from the interviews that we had with the, with the teachers. And then after we done this exercise, we, we started doing some analysis. Uh, based on the data that we, were get, we got from the from mapping of schools and also uh, the surveys that we were conducting. So this is just uh, a, a snapshot of it. We have a paper that we've, we've published. i share the link uh, towards the end. But this is just some short analysis from the, from the information that we got. So 77% of people living in Kibera had limited uh, accessibility to wash facilities. And one thing that also came out that was a bit shocking for us was in one of the places in Imadare, uh, we learned that most of them couldn't access like toilets. They don't have like toilets within the, uh, within the, so we have what we call plots. So it's just like a number of uh, buildings that are close to each other. So those are referred as a plot. But we realize most of them don't have toilets within uh, those areas. So they are depending on uh, public toilets that are uh, uh, maybe like one or two minutes or three minutes out of their homes. Then curfew came in. Then that meant uh, from 6 p.m. up to 5 a.m., you can't go outside to relieve yourself. So that was a big, uh, it was a big shocker for us because we were trying to understand how do you, do you cope with that? That uh, maybe at 9 p.m. you need to use the wash facility, but here you are, you can't go outside because Again, you are afraid of the police. If they find you outside, they will arrest you. Again, that means you have to pay fine. You've lost your job. How are you going to pay for, even for that fine? So it's something that we've really been discussing on how we can help even such communities, uh, trying to look for partners who can be able not to maybe assist such communities to ensure that they have access, access to toilets, if, even if it's possible to just put two or three within the so we don't know anything else can happen. We can have another pandemic. If you don't provide this solution, then that means the same problems that they had uh, during this uh, season, they will also experience the same problem. And then 60% of people living in Madare uh, also had limited uh, wash uh, accessibility to wash facilities. And then there's a clear geographic pattern in wash accessibility, both in Kibera and, and Madare. So, uh, you could tell that in maybe in Kibera, because of many organizations working there, there are more water facilities uh, within the community compared to Madare. You'll find again accessibility to uh, things like toilets. You find a lot of organizations are also working in Kibera, putting up uh, toilet facilities. So it meant uh, the pattern is a bit different because in one area there, there are more. Uh, uh, facilities compared to the other, so it means even in terms of accessing these uh, facilities, differed in both uh, both communities. So, what is the way forward for for us? I think I'll just mention maybe uh, 
talk about education, one thing that we realized and we, all, we came out so clearly was the challenge that families were having on e-learning. Like most of them are, would really love to help their children continue their education. But e-learning depends on internet. You have to have internet to access these materials. Then here you are, you've lost your job. One, you can't, you're not even sure you're able to provide for your family uh, the meal for the day. Then you're being told again you need to buy internet uh, bundles to ensure that your child can be able to learn. That proved to be a challenge for most families. And within that six months, I think most of them, are like their learning like completely came to a stop because their parents couldn't, couldn't support that. And then in other areas also, there are, par there are parents who are not well educated. Like for them, <coughs> sorry, they're also, they're trying as much as possible to ensure their children are learning so that they can bring them, they can take them out of these communities. So if you're given homework and you need to do it at home, your parent can't do it. So here you are stranded again. So there are a lot of ideas that were coming from the schools. One of them was in case of such, such thing happening, then uh, maybe the school can organize providing materials within the community and allocating them to specific locations where the students can be able to access it. But another thing that we also realize is most of the ed tech tools are quite expensive. So this is just a challenge to us uh, for this community. If we could come up with tools that can make it easy for, for students to access education material at a very either cheap or maybe at a subsidized uh, price, that could really help. In case anything happens, like uh, we have another situation where we face a, pan a pandemic, then we can always be sure that education will still continue. We will, as, as students in their home, they can be able to continue learning without any challenges of accessing, like depending highly on internet or lack of materials because they can't pay for it. So this is just a challenge to us as a first community. If we could come up with tools that could uh, maybe focus on ed tech, that could provide uh, easy materials for students, especially in such needy communities. Uh, thank you. Uh, my contacts are there. If you need to talk to us, uh, information is there. Then the paper that we publish is here. If you, you can also look at it, it uh, gives more details about uh, the work that we did, focused mainly on the water and sanitation. Yeah. Thank you so much.